Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Chulov, and I'm The Guardian's Middle East correspondent, and it's my great honor to be here this morning uh, to welcome you all to the King Faisal Center and to chair this morning's panel this, of this inaugural conference in, into countering uh, radical terrorism. I'd like to start by inviting this morning's panelists to the stage, if they could all join me now. Sir John Jenkins, Richard Barrett, uh, Dr. Abdullah Al Khalid, and also Will McCants. Good morning again. Um, very much looking forward to this discussion this morning. Um, uh, let me start by more formally introducing our panelists. Uh, on my left is Sir John Jenkins, uh, who I believe to be one of the British government's most preeminent minds on the Middle East for, for a long time. Sir John has had a 35-year career in the British diplomatic service. Uh, he, he took up a position in January 2015 of uh, executive director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Bahrain after serving as, um, as uh, Her Majesty's Ambassador to Burma, to, uh, to East Jerusalem, Damascus, Baghdad, uh, Libya, and finally Riyadh. So uh, a, a, an immense amount of, uh, of experience there as, 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 a, as a diplomat and as an ambassador, and it's a pleasure to have Sir John with us this morning. Uh, to, my, to my right at the end is uh, Richard Barrett, who was now the, the senior advisor for the Sufan Group and a former head of global counterterrorism operations for MI6 and also a former head of the United Nations monitoring team for Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. So uh, an, another preeminent voice on, on the, the very issues that we're here to talk about today. To my immediate right, uh, Will McCants, who is the director of US relations with the Islamic world at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. Uh, Will has also been a senior advisor to the State Department and the Department of Defense, uh, and an and, 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 and analyst at the Institute for Defense Analysis, the Center for Naval Analysis, and others. To my, to my uh, far left is, uh, is Abdullah bin Khalid, Al Saud, an assistant professor of Naif Arab University for Security Sciences in Riyadh here. Uh, Dr. Abdullah's PhD thesis investigated the drivers and factors contributing to the process of radicalization and violence in Saudi Arabia from the early days of the 1980s until the outbreak of the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula terror campaign in the kingdom in 2003. So some, some very illustrious guests here to start this discussion. Um, and the, the format for this morning is that, uh, is that uh, my four friends will, will speak briefly uh, for six minutes, just about uh, areas of their expertise. And then we'll revert to a period of question and answers. And I always find that in these discussions that, uh, that the question and, and answer period is the most stimulating and rewarding of, of any panel. It's, it's where there is a a very useful uh, interaction with, uh, with other informed members of the audience, and I, I very much look forward to, to getting to that phase of, of, of our morning. Before we start, I, I just thought I'd offer some observations uh, of my own. I've been uh, a correspondent in the Middle East now for 12 years. I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time in Iraq and Syria, and, uh, and I've certainly witnessed up quite close and personal the the, the rise of the Islamic State over the last three years 
its gradual decline now, but also the, uh, the environment which led to the, the threat that we, uh, we so graphically and starkly saw in mid-2014, and that being the, the geopolitical situation in Iraq and beyond, uh, the, uh, the years that followed the US invasion of Iraq, uh, the gradual disenfranchisement on a political level that, uh, that involved the Sunnis of the region in particular, uh, not just in Iraq, but uh, also in Lebanon, and increasingly as this Syrian civil war uh, started to intensify in Syria as well. Now, th there are any number of starting points for the, the, this phenomenon we now know as the Islamic State, and I'm sure our panelists have uh, varying views on, on where they may be. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, all played factors in getting us to this uh, point in, in modern history where the, the very viability of the, of the, of the nation states that have been uh, carved out of uh, the region over the, of the past century have at times been threatened. We have a, a, a toxic ideology that has somehow captured the, uh, the imaginations of a, of a, of a, of a small number, but uh, a significant number of, of disenfranchised youth who have seen a message that Islamic State provides as being something worthy of aspiring to, adhering to, and, and committing to. Now that's, unwinding that has been a challenge that that policymakers have faced for the past decade and I think will continue to face for many years to come. Uh, it is true that uh, the Islamic State, or, or Daesh as we call it, does face military defeat, uh, certainly in Iraq and Syria where it is very much on the back foot after, see, after seizing such a swathe of land, roughly the size of, of Jordan from Iraq and Syria in mid-2014 and exposing the fragility of, of state authority in Iraq. A sustained military campaign in which the Islamic coalition has played a role has, uh, has, strip, has t seized five cities from them, seized two thirds of its land and has confined Daesh to the, uh, a small corner of northeastern Mosul, its last urban stronghold in Iraq, and also a, a corner of northwestern Iraq and part of Anbar province. And in, inside Syria, Raqqa is under serious military threat. Deir Azor and, the, and the, uh, the, the far eastern border won't be far away. But what comes next? And that's the very reason we're here today, to talk about the day after for Islamic State. As, uh, as the, the topic of this morning's panel is, is Daesh 2.0, the, the future for this organization. And uh, as I said earlier, I think it's essential that uh, us as policymakers, as, as, as people who, who cover uh, this phenomenon, do put our minds together and conceptualize the day after ISIS, because that day is soon. And if, if we don't prepare for it, is there going to be uh, further environment, uh, further room for this organization to, to reinvent itself, to metastasize yet again, as it, as it did throughout uh, 2008 through to 2010, and continue to pose a, a significant threat, not just to the regional order, but to the global order itself. So without f further ado, um, let me uh, just open the floor to Sir John Jenkins. Uh, each, pa each panelist has six minutes to just to introduce themselves and talk about issues that matter to them. And, then, as I say, we will we'll throw open to questions. Sir John. Thank you very much, <coughs> Martin. <coughs> and uh, uh, thank you very much to the, to the Faisal Center as well for inviting me, indeed all of us uh, here. I think this is a fantastic uh, conference. I think this subject is, of course, of urgent um, uh, and sustained importance to all of us uh, who work uh, and live in the region. I wish to say thank you very much, in particular, to His Royal Highness Prince Turkey and of course to Dr. Saro Sarhan um, for organizing this, uh, this event. <coughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly, well, I shouldn't be surprised really um, by the two questions I'm constantly asked uh, in this region uh, when we talk about this subject and related issues. One is, uh, who's behind Daesh? Uh, and the other is, why have all these interventions failed? Uh, why couldn't you do better in Iraq? Why couldn't you do better in, in, uh, in Libya and elsewhere? Um, and in some sense, um, they're related, but in some sense also, of course, they miss the point. 
the, the origins of Daesh or Fahish uh, are, um, uh, are, are complex, but, but by and large uh, pretty well mapped out. I mean, the ideational background to Daesh in various forms of dissident uh, and uh, often um, uh, distorted uh, 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 and politically mobilized Salafism, um, which emerged out of uh, the whole stew of, uh, of doctrinal debate and thinking uh, from the 1960s onwards uh, in this region as a whole, uh, but partly here in Saudi Arabia and partly in, in places like Egypt and so forth, which combined uh, forms of dissident Salafism. And I use Salafism as, as a sort of shorthand. I mean, Salafism is, is, is an extremely complex phenomenon and in some ways is a misnomer, as, uh, as, uh, as Prince Turkey said this morning, combined with the political mobilization and purposefulness of Muslim Brotherhood related groups. This is, we know this, there's, there's been an awful lot uh, 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 studied. We also know the sort of trajectory that, 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 that Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and Al-Qaeda in, in the land of the two rivers and, and Daesh followed uh, in Iraq. I mean, that's also been pretty well mapped out. There were, there were some areas of dispute, there were some, there were some areas uh, of obscurity, but by and large, we understand the sort of trajectory uh, that happened. And of course, Iraq was the incubator. Of, of, of this. So from 2003 onwards, uh, Iraq uh, enabled um, individuals and groups uh, to, uh, to, to mobilize, to come together, to operationalize, and to seed. Uh, not just operations, but also ideas uh, in an extremely effective and complex way. <coughs> the issue for me, and this is something that, that, that Ash Carter was talking about uh, in, in his remarks, and indeed uh, Franco Vettini, is, is about the context which makes this which makes this possible and which makes this particularly dangerous in a sustained way. So when I back, think back to my time in Iraq uh, between 2009 and 2011, we were talking about this the other night. <coughs> uh, I mean, looking back, uh, this was clearly the period where, where, where Daesh reseeded themselves uh, across, uh, across Iraq, uh, particularly in places like Mosul, but also in Diyala. I mean, these were two of the main uh, areas uh, where they regrouped. Zarqawi himself had used Diyala as a base. Most of when I was in Iraq was still an extremely dangerous place. But certainly, I don't, I, and this may have been wider, but it was certainly the case for me, th this looked to me like the dying, uh, 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 um, uh, the threshing about of a dying organization. Uh, and when we looked at the time, and I remember very distinctly when we all sort of looked at, at, at the figures for violence and, and, and the data, and everybody said, we don't want to do body counts, we don't want to do uh, data counts, uh, because this is crude. But actually, in the end, that's what we did. Uh, and when you looked at the data, there'd been this massive falling off of violence, uh, partly as a result of the surge, which had been extremely successful, a military surge in 2000, uh, 2007, 2008. Um, uh, and so violence had been massively reduced in that period after the, after the, uh, the, uh, the, the bombing of the Alaska Mosque in, in Samara in 2006, April 2006. And it was bumping along. At what looked, if you looked at the graphs, because the graphs we all looked at went back to the beginning. So you had this massive spike. So what you saw when I was there was, 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 was a trend line which looked as if it was bumping along the bottle, bottom. Now, if you interrogated this violence and actually were asked who was being killed, what the methods were, who was doing what to whom, it was clear, actually, if you lived in particular areas or you, or you belonged to particular parts of the Iraqi state in particular, particularly military, military uh, and police officers, uh, it wasn't a good time. You were getting hit. You were getting hit by drive-by shootings. You were, getting, you were getting whacked, as I think they say in the United States, uh, on the street, and you were getting blown up by sticky bombs, which were being put on, on, on the vehicle. Very simple, low level. The Islamic State were able, uh, it was a guy actually didn't work at the time, were able... To, 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 to set off from time to time car bombs. In fact, these were spectaculars. But the most important thing was this low-level pulse of violence. And when I think of what happened subsequent, and when you look at what happened in Mosul, clearly in Mosul, Al-Qaeda, again, the, the, the Islamic State, had retained the capacity, had retained cells. It had ceded itself from Mosul. And it clearly also ceded itself from Fallujah and, 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 uh, and, uh, and Ramadi, and maybe to Crete. They'd never gone away. <coughs> We, and I say we, this was the coalition with the, uh, with the Iraqi uh, government, had had a very effective counterterrorism uh, 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 um, uh, strategy uh, uh, between about 2004 and, and, and 2009, which was intelligence-based, uh, SF-led, special forces-led, and highly kinetic. 
and people and a lot of a lot of what I consider to be bad guys were being taken out at the time. The people who weren't being combated at this time, of course, were the Shia militias. And when I look back, you know, so everybody thinks now of, of, of Al Maliki's Salat uh, al uh, Farsain, the Charge of the Knights, down in Basra and then later in Sada City in 2008 onwards. As, as, as the Iraqi government trying to get to grips with militias. I don't think it was, because that same government, including al Maliki, had stopped coalition forces going after these militias down in the south, many of whom had, were, were, were sadrist special groups. And looking back, what he was doing was seeking to co-opt these militias in his interests, which is something we've seen subsequently. I didn't understand this at the time, so when people ask me what you could have done better, the first thing we could have done better is understand more what was happening. But this also points to an important issue, which I think was raised in the first session, and I hope we'll, we'll talk more about, which is the context within which these things happen. We, we, you, you asked me the other night whether it would have been <coughs> better if, if Alawi, Dr. Ayad Alawi, who I declare an interest as a friend of mine, uh, had been able to form the government in 2010, as he should have done, because he won the election. Uh, and of course, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, counterintuitive history. I mean, he didn't. He should have done. I think it would have been different, because, not simply because I think he might have been, a more, been able to move more effectively against some of the, the, the more toxic Shia militias, but also because what, what al Iraqiya represented, for all its faults, was an alliance of Shia and Sunnah. And you would have brought the Sunnah into government. And when I think about how we combat this in the future, uh, uh, Frank was talking about this, you, you need to have a, a political and economic um, uh, uh, um, reconstruction, which you do, but it needs to be very, very specific. This will not destroy Daesh, because Daesh is ideational. You cannot destroy ideas. They're out there. But what it does is enable us in Iraq, I'm not saying anything about Syria, to combat it more effectively. But you have to move against both. The state, I mean, when I was in, in, in Jerusalem, Abu Mazen used to say, you need to have a unified state with a unified security authority to move against all threats to it. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Sir John. Um, it's fascinating remarks, and I look forward to expanding on them later. I'd like to bring in uh, Richard Barrett now, and then just to, uh, to ask you, Richard, if you'd mind uh, just uh, starting with, with your opening statement. With. Thank you. And thank you to the King Faisal Center for including me in this conference. I think already, even in such a short time, we've had a great deal of food for thought from the presentations before mine. Uh, I'd started looking at terrorism before 9-11, and uh, there's been a whole generation of people grown up since then who are far more expert about it than me. But also, in that 16 years or so, there's been a vast investment of money by governments around the world. Terrorism now is one of the key issues of our day. But if I were a member of the tax-paying public of the world, which I suppose I am, I do pay my taxes, I'd maybe be tempted to ask for my money back. Because after all that money, all those trillions of dollars being spent, Actually, we're slightly worse off, so far as the terrorist threat is concerned, than we were on 9-11. And I wonder why that is. I think that the problem is worse. I think, decidedly, I mean, if you look at the United Kingdom, for example, we've had 14 disrupted plots in the last four years. That's an awful lot compared to what happened prior to 9-11, though, of course, we had Irish terrorism then, a very different sort of terrorism. Uh, over recent years, we've had 260 people convicted of terrorist uh, attacks or, or implications in terrorism, terrorist plotting. We have currently at least 500 active investigations, police investigations going along uh, on terrorism. And of course, there are many, many more people who are subjects of interest to the security services and the police. And beyond the actuality, beyond the reality of the problem, there is, of course, the perception of the problem which is worse still, the public at large, not just in the United Kingdom, but I would say in all Western countries, certainly, uh, regard terrorism as either their first or second concern, according to surveys by Pew and other organizations like that. Well, this points, I think, not to the threat, which is pretty minimal. I mean, the risk of anybody, any particular individual in the West being affected by terrorism is so small as 
to be unquantifiable. It's, 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 there's, there is no threat. But the fact that everybody sees it as such a threat, of course, is evidence of the success of terrorism as a tactic. And I think much of our response has helped to make it more successful. In essence, uh, any terrorist, any individual terrorist, rarely acts on purely local, individual, personal reasons. They may be psychological, they may be social, they may be political, they may be economic. But it's some mix of local grievance which draws him into this form of terrorism. And it's a fact, of course, that even in a family, say, of four or five brothers, you'll find one going off to be a terrorist and another going off to be an architect, something like that. It's not just environment that does it. So we have to take that into account. And of course, terrorist groups do take it into account. Terrorist groups are extremely successful in wrapping up individual grievances into an overall framework that explains why one individual is finding life so hard. And particularly, of course, they attract people in the West, anyway, who are on the margins of society. That's why about 75% of terrorists who've been identified in Western countries turn out to have a criminal record or otherwise known to the police. So terrorist groups are good at bringing in individuals who are inclined to become terrorists. And terrorist groups are very good at defining everything in terms of them and us. They're very good at making things black and white. And that, of course, I think comes to the fundamental issue of our response and where we make the mistake, because we too have tended to put things as them or us. There are the terrorists over there and there's the rest of us over here. And so international relations have been defined since 9-11 as you're either with us or against us in this very simplistic sort of attitude, which doesn't take account, perhaps, of why individuals are joining terrorist groups and why terrorist groups are thriving. And if we continue to cast everything in those terms, if we continue to make our security response the fundamental and defining element of our international and bilateral relationships, then I think we're going to get locked into this problem of not understanding that the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism are not necessarily just political. They're not necessarily, and probably not at all, to do, for example, with issues of religion. I rather subscribe to Olivia Roy's theory that, in fact, a radical then seeks for something to attach to, which is and can be religious attach uh, 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 an attachment. But most of our terrorists in the West are right-wing extremists. You don't hear so much about them, but about half of the cases in the UK under investigation are to do with right-wing extremists. And there are many, many more right-wing extremists in the United States, of course, than there, than there are people who would be labeled as Islamist or whatever. Well, we seek simplicity in our response uh, because the public demands that. The public is not particularly astute in understanding the drivers of terrorism. But then it's not the public's role to be astute about that, and nor is it the press's role to explain the complexity to the public. The press reports and the press media, of course, attempts to gain more viewers and more readers and so on. So it does so in a way that the public's likely to appreciate and respond to. But our response, our visual response of kinetic military uh, response like the mother of all bombs being dropped in Afghanistan or something in a war that still continues after 16 years and will carry on continuing, um, doesn't, it may be good television, but it, it's not good counterterrorism necessarily unless it goes hand in hand with something broader. I don't say, of course, that we don't need military effort to stop terrorism, but we need to understand far more about why the individual terrorist joins a terrorist group, why he expresses himself in that violent antisocial way. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been at the forefront of this, done an amazing job in looking at individual motivation and trying to bring back people into society. But I'm afraid for the many of the rest of us, and President Frattini said we lack a strategy. I think we lack a strategy because we lack the ability to articulate a strategy that could devote all those resources to individuals 
rather than to groups. So we're locked into two wars which seem to be going on forever. The, the most vicious civil war in Syria that I think has ever been recorded and of course insurgencies in Nigeria and Somalia and in many other parts of the world as well as terrorist groups that are effective in Southeast Asia and Russia and elsewhere. So my final point would be to spend more time following that Saudi example of understanding why the individual becomes a terrorist and looking at those drivers and trying to address those drivers alongside the necessary kinetic effort to destroy terrorist groups. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, we look forward to expanding on those remarks in the panel discussion and, and certainly in the question and answer session a bit later. Uh, I'd like now to turn to Will McCants uh, for your opening remarks, Will. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're talking about Daesh 2.0, so I thought I might make some predictions about what's going to come in the next few years. That is usually unwise in the field of terrorism, but nonetheless. Um, I think it's instructive to look at the uh, recent and uh, not so recent history of ISIS uh, in order to understand what they're going to do next. The organization has lost half of its territory in Syria and Iraq. It's, lo it's lost something on the magnitude of over 60,000 of its fighters, uh, and yet it still continues to function. Uh, it still controls quite a bit of territory, and so it will continue uh, in the near future to retain some sort of government. Uh, eventually, its government will collapse, and it will be driven, if the coalition is successful, underground. And so I think that's where we need to uh, spend some time uh, deliberating on and thinking about what comes next when they're driven underground again. They have been in this situation before, and I think their history in the previous decade is quite instructive. What did they spend their time doing? Uh, the first thing that they did, as has already been mentioned on this panel, is they began to go after the people in the security apparatus and in the tribal awakenings, the Sahwad, uh, to eliminate anyone who could stand against them in the future. So these weren't just revenge killings, these were targeted killings meant to intimidate and dissuade enemies that they would have in the future should they get another opportunity to try and take over territory again. One estimate has it that they killed something on the level of 2,000 individuals in preparation for a comeback within the span of two years, so we can anticipate something of the same if they're driven underground again. What did they also do? They spent time organizing themselves financially, uh, creating a very sophisticated and complicated uh, uh, mafia-style extortion racket, particularly based in Mosul, where they were still, even when they were underground as a terror organization, raising millions of dollars a year, so we can anticipate the same uh, in the best of circumstances. They will continue to have a very strong terror organization raising a lot of money. The third thing that they did during the period of their so-called defeat in the previous decade is they went about replenishing their ranks. Number one, figuring out how better to work with the tribes in Iraq. Uh, number two, by initiating a series of jailbreaks to uh, help some of their leadership escape. And number three, by carrying out a series of spectacular terror attacks, uh, targeting churches and, and other infrastructure in Iraq, to stay in the public eye, and importantly, stay in the eye of the jihadist community to try and continue to attract recruits. And I think we can anticipate that they will do all of these things, again, should they be driven underground in the next few years. Outside of Syria and Iraq, uh, their fortunes as an insurgency look bleaker than they did a year or two ago. A year or two ago, you'll remember, they controlled some bit of territory in Libya. Uh, they were much stronger in the Sinai Peninsula. Their viability, their capability as an insurgent organization abroad has diminished. It's not disappeared, but it has diminished. Uh, it, as an organization, has a trouble Rate, waging an insurgency outside of Syria and Iraq because it doesn't have a natural base of support and this is an organization that does not play well with other organizations. So unlike Al-Qaeda, 
they have difficulty then having alliances with other groups that could help them achieve their ends. They are much better situated as a terror organization. That's where they will continue to be strong internationally. And I think for the global community uh, is where they represent one of the greatest threats, uh, particularly to politics. As, as Richard said previously, they are not an existential threat uh, to, say, Western nations the way they might be in some parts of the Middle East, but they do represent a real threat to politics. Uh, uh, particularly, say, in the United States and in Europe. Uh, they have a huge number of foreign fighters that have been fighting for the organization that is compounded by two decades of foreigners coming to fight in civil wars in the Middle East and South and Central Asia. Uh, this group, this so-called foreign fighter glut, has grown quite large as it snowballed and they're going to be looking for other opportunities abroad. The month of fasting is coming up, Ramadan. If you'll remember last year, this was the time when the organization tried to demonstrate its strength internationally. And Ramadan is coming up once again, and I think once again they're going to attempt to show the world just how strong they are, which unfortunately means carrying out terror attacks. If they are unable to mount a lot of attacks, I think we can deduce from that that the strength of the organization internationally has waned somewhat. Finally, uh, just a word about the future and viability of the organization after losing its territory. Losing its territory in Syria and Iraq will be a major blow to the organization. Uh, it has justified its existence, not only in Islamic terms, but in political terms as a successful insurgency and state-building enterprise. If it loses that enterprise, it will be a critical blow to the legitimacy of the organization, but not a fatal blow. The very fact that they achieved what they achieved in Syria and Iraq will continue to fire the imagination of young people across the world. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Will. It sets the scene very, very well. Now, Dr. Abdullah bin Khalid Al Saud, um, we very much welcome your contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the King Faisal Center and the International Military Counterterrorism Coalition for putting together this important and timely uh, conference. And I would also like to welcome you all to, to my home country, to Saudi Arabia. I hope you all have a very enjoyable and fruitful time here. Um, as Will just mentioned, uh, there is no doubt that Daesh is under immense pressure right now in terms of geography. It lost more than half the territory it used to control. Its revenue slashed by more than half. Its ability to recruit internationally also uh, diminished considerably. The flow of foreign fighters coming into Syria and Iraq um, diminished. And also its media production uh, and output. Uh, many of the, um, I think 40 or around 40, media offices uh, that used to be active during the height uh, of its media production in the summer of 2015, uh, 2015 has been dormant in recent months. So I would like to, to look at the future trends or the, the results that can uh, really happen as, a, uh, as, a, as this pressure continues in the core territory. I will argue briefly three points, three main points. First is that uh, some of the peripheries may strengthen and the threat therein intensify. What I mean by that is that Daesh uh, will, will certainly try to conduct and inspire attacks abroad in order to uh, demonstrate its stay in power, alleviate uh, the pressure it's under, uh, and claim even symbolic victories every now and then. Uh, also, um, some uh, in Iraq and Syria might, might find it uh, attractive to relocate to other affiliates in the region. And uh, I have to, to note here that uh, the regional picture is not even in this regard. Despite the fact that Daesh announced in 2014 a wilaya in Saudi Arabia, this can only be found in paper. Even its, its um, terrorist attacks and, and violent campaign in the kingdom uh, seems to have lost momentum in, in recent months uh, and faltered. And that is to do uh, mainly because of the outstanding job of the security forces and their expertise uh, of the, of the counter-terrorist uh, uh, security apparatus in the kingdom. Their last attack here was in November 2015, and it was a very uh, simple hit-and-run attack. 
The one before that was in July uh, 2016, and it was uh, uh, three coordinated attacks in three different cities on the same day, and they were all failures. One of them was uh, against the Prophet's Mosque. Um, that, unfortunately, can't be said to other uh, countries in the region. So uh, places like uh, the Sinai Peninsula or, or Yemen or Libya or even Afghanistan uh, may, t may, may prove uh, attractive to some of the officers. So this is the, the first point, the preferees. The second point, uh, which is also um, predictable, is that under immense pressure, fragmentations will occur, splits and defections. We have heard so many reports that many foreign fighters have reached Turkey in recent months, contacted their embassies, uh, and indicated their willingness to retain home. And now here's, the cha here's a challenge for the counter-terrorist uh, agencies in, in all the countries to really distinguish between those who are disillusioned and those who pose as such to come back home and, and engage in, in uh, building networks and cells. Um, so the, 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 uh, the, there is another uh, also possible uh, side where defections can happen. Most of you maybe have heard of the Hazimi trend or the Hazimi group. It first appeared in 2014, and it deemed the, the uh, extremist position of Daesh as soft, which is something uh, I thought is impossible. But um, in, recent, uh, in, the recent, in the last month's uh, issue of Naba, which is the Arabic language magazine of Daesh, they reissued uh, their statement uh, regarding this trend. And they also translated it and published it in Rumiya in French and German. That indicates uh, that there might be a resurgence of this trend now in, in Raqqa or in Syria and Iraq. Um, it remains to be seen how that develops, if it, gets, if it gains momentum or not. Uh, this is the second point. The third and last point is what also William uh, mentioned just before, is that it is very wrong to, to view uh, Daesh as static. They will most certainly innovate and adapt to changing uh, situations and environment. It's more or less like the process of metamorphism that rocks undergo under intense heat and pressure. They move from one type of rock to another while still in a solid state. Uh, examples of their innovations uh, in terms of weaponry, for example, they use drones. Just three days ago, they, they released uh, a video um, to Wilaya Tnainawa. And large part of the video, they were boasting about their production uh, of weaponry, uh, RPGs, and stuff. Uh, in terms of adaptation, they will most certainly retreat to the desert and engage in aggressive insurgency. Al-Adnani, uh, their spokesman before uh, his death in 2016, he even foreshadowed this, this trend. He said, we will if we lose territory, we'll retreat to the desert, we'll come back even stronger. That's more wishful thinking, I think, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, losing uh, their territory and defeating the military will not mean the end of them. Um, radical ideologies do not need uh, territories to survive uh, if, there are, if, if, the, if, the, if the structural environment and conditions that were conducive to their rise in the first place remain uh, unaddressed, then we are sure they will be surviving in other form uh, or shape. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdullah, and thank you very much to, to all our speakers this morning. Um, now let's just switch to a, uh, a panel discussion before we get to some questions and answers. And uh, I wanted to start with you, Sir John, um, and I wanted to take you back to 2008, 9, and 10, your time as ambassador in Baghdad. It was all looking pretty good there for a while, wasn't it? Um, the trend lines were, 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 were reasonable. The, the surge had worked. There'd been a a partnership between the tribes of Anbar and the US military and others, which had led to the earlier incarnation of, of Daesh being, being kicked out. And things were looking uh, relatively solid. What happened? And, and how did they get uh, reorganized and remobilized? What was the current that actually pushed that onwards? So you mentioned uh, the 2010 election, in which uh, Iyad Alawi won the popular vote but could not form a coalition. How instructive do you think that was in what we saw in the years afterwards? I think, I think we simply misread it politically, uh, and we misread it catastrophically, uh, quite honestly. Um, there was a feeling, uh, you know, if, if you go back to the circumstances in which, um, in which uh, Maliki took over from Jafari in 2006, um, Al Maliki was seen, I think, uh, by quite a lot of people as more malleable, and Jaffari, and so would be more effective in serving 
uh, particularly US agenda, but a coalition agenda. Actually, it turned out that Maliki was his own guy uh, and was a, an extremely skilled maneuver and exploiter of others' weaknesses. Um, uh, there was, when I was there, there was quite a lot of talk about Maliki being a strong guy, a tough guy, and Iraq needed a tough guy. And if you go to Iraq, all Iraqis will say, what we really need is a Hajjaj back. You know, I, I, I don't think Iraq is, in, 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 2000, in, 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 in 2017, is the same as Kufa, you know, 1,400 years ago, but, but it, there's a sense. And I think people bought into that. The trouble is, you know, I, I understand the point of having a strong central government. The problem I have is having a strong individual at the top of that government who then monopolizes power and uses that power to marginalize others, which is what Maliki very successfully did. And this speaks to this whole question. I mean, Richard was talking about, <coughs> about Olivier Roy and Gilles Capel and, and, and their current, uh, uh, their current um, very French controversy about, about, about who's right. You know, in the end, it's both of them. If, when you think of, uh, when, when uh, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi stood up in the great mosque of Nuruddin Zinki, you know, with his black turban, as I say, and, and dressed with the black flags of the Abbasids, uh, repeating the exact words of, of Abu Bakr when he, when he accepted the succession from the, uh, from the Prophet, uh, he's saying something in the same way as when Zaharan Alush, the, the late Zaharan Alush, says, I too want a caliphate, but I want an Umayyad caliphate. I want a caliphate uh, Umayyad. Uh, <coughs> They're saying something. They're appealing to a, to a way in which people frame their discontents. <coughs> and what happened in Iraq was that these discontents became frameable. And they became frameable because a, a, a sufficient number of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, the Sunni, of the Sunni in Iraq felt themselves not just excluded, uh, but significantly oppressed by a Maliki. Now, when you think about what happened to the Sahwa, to, to the Islamic awakening, the sons of Iraq, you know, they, as part of the uh, they were promised that they would be reintegrated into the, into the Iraqi security forces, basically, by and large. What happened was that they were reintegrated into the lowest jobs of all, or sacked. And then, and then Maliki went after them, in the same way as it went, went after politicians. So, it's to do, so, and we missed all that. Or is, I, I certainly, if we, if we didn't miss it, we ignored it, and I think that was a real problem, and it remains a problem because, it, as, 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 uh, as others have been saying on this panel, <coughs> um, it is this, it is this sense of anyway, ultimately. I mean, Daesh have attracted a lot of support, but ultimately, most of them have said no to them. That failure to reintegrate the Sahwa uh, in, in Maliki, giving them lower roles. I mean, that just fed the sense of disenfranchisement, but. Around that time, though, the uh, Alawi was uh, Alawi won the popular vote yeah. with Sunni support. Yeah. Al Alawi is a, as a secular Shia. Now, the, the very fact that uh, he could not form a government or wasn't allowed to, I mean, was that a fatal blow in terms of? Uh, you know, I think, I think when well, I look back to 2010, you know, Iraq. Whatever you think of, of the invasion in 2003 and the overthrow of the Sudanese state, there were various points along with that trajectory in which Iraq could still have been. Or, or something positive could have been rescued from the, from the, from the wreckage. 2010, for me, was the most significant moment. I, I think there's, there's still something there, because it's still a central state. Um, but 2010 was the most significant moment. It was a real turning point. Um, uh, because Maliki basically, uh, once, he'd, once he'd been able to persuade Mithab Mahmoud, who was the chief justice, to give him this breathing space to cobble his coalition together, and once the Iranians had come in behind him um, uh, to, to force others, including Saddam, uh, to back him. It took a long time, but, but, it, but it worked. What was the point of voting? I mean, we'd all said this was supposed to be a, a democracy. There had been an election. It was relatively clean. It was pretty fair, and it produced a result that actually I thought was a good result. Maliki didn't, and we allowed him to get away with it. Now, Richard, uh, speaking of significant moments, uh, your final uh, years in government coincided with 9-11. Uh, with which certainly revolutionized the, the world of, uh, of, of counterterrorism. Now, casting forward 15, 16 years, uh, we've seen ISIS or Daesh uh, do its best to export chaos into Europe. We've seen the results of that. But how do you deal as, uh, as a, a regional intelligence order with a, an organization that has the capacity to do what it's done, and that is to import potentially hundreds of, of people into into Western Europe, into the US, but also into Saudi Arabia and other states, just sitting to wait to be activated. What sort of a threat is that to the intelligence community? Well, I think it's a very good question. Of course, the question that's being asked the whole time, because uh, if from Western countries about 30,000 
oh, sorry, well, about 6,000 probably from Western countries, 30,000 foreign fighters in all going to join uh, Daesh in Iraq, Syria. Uh, possibly about 20, 25% of those have now gone home. But I think the key part of your question is, are they all waiting to be activated or have they just gone home? And I think that that is a challenge for security and intelligence services to filter out those who may pose an immediate or future threat and those who actually did what they had to do. Maybe they got disillusioned, maybe they got horrified, uh, maybe they just sort of thought they'd made a mistake and come back. Uh, those people are perhaps less likely to be a threat in the future. Though, of course, one of the big, big problems about returning foreign fighters is that their future behavior is totally unpredictable. And if they made that decision to go and join a very violent group in Iraq, Syria, they may equally decide to join a very violent group in their home countries down the road when their repulsion from violence has, has worn off. So that's the key thing. I mean, one of the um, major changes, I guess, in recent years over dealing with the terrorist threat, apart from the much better international cooperation that uh, exists, is that terrorists themselves have gone from being very, very covert to being quite overt. Most of the people who originally went to join Daesh, of course, were happy to uh, show themselves on videos. They burnt their passports as a demonstration of no intention of return and so on. Um, <clears throat> and so, relatively speaking, they were moderately easy to identify. Unfortunately, now, terrorists have gone way back to the sort of covert side, and so they do present a bit more of a challenge. But nonetheless, I think that most would agree that if you pull a thread, you'll probably find it attached to other threads in counterterrorism. This idea of the lone wolf, for example, coming back and doing his own thing, is, is not very well supported in fact. So it still relies very much on knowing who went, why they went, why they came back, indeed. You know, I mean, the people who attacked Bataclan and so on were not returnees in the extent that they'd come back. They were returnees in the extent they'd been sent back. And uh, their, uh, th that distinction, of course, is a very, very important one and I think will require a great deal further uh, international cooperation to, to unravel. Thanks very much, Richard. Now, Will, you touched on something earlier which um, has been a reason for being, in many ways, for, for Daesh, the latest incarnation of it, and that was its capacity to control geography. Now, as its territory started to be stripped from it through the, through the military campaign, it seems to have switched focus and said, well, geography isn't as important as we said it was going to be. Take Dubbuk, for example. Controlling populations is. And that being being able to incite chaos far beyond its so-called caliphate. Is that new uh, de self-definition credible? And, uh, and, and what can ISIS or Daesh continue to represent to people if it, if it cannot hold on to territory? Uh, well, it remains to be seen if it's credible. I mean, we know at the moment that it has the loss of territory has led to a loss of foreigners coming to fight for the organization, but it can also be that the security services around the world have gotten better at interdicting those folks, so it's, it's hard to say at the moment. But I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that when the organization was defeated as an insurgency in the prior decade, uh, you would have anticipated that its uh, animating idea of proclaiming itself an Islamic state would have been defeated as well and people would have laughed at its project. Uh, quite the opposite happened. That is the point in 2009 when other uh, jihadist groups began to take up the organization's flag um, and began to adopt its cause. Uh, and you know, over the course of, say, the last 10, 15 years, we have seen a development um, not so much in the strategic thinking of these organizations, but in their practical experience. I mean, much of the strategic literature that has been written uh, uh, for how to wage an insurgency, how to carry out a global uh, campaign of terror was written back in 2003, 2004. They haven't really updated the doctrine. What's changed is just so many more places to apply it. And they have tremendous experience now in fighting wars, 
and now also in governing. And because there are so many unstable places in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, they can continue to try and run the experiment uh, over and over again. And, the, and the, the challenge, I think, for the international coalition and for the coalition that Saudi Arabia is leading um, is that these organizations um, can frustrate attempts to stabilize these civil wars. They are not, many of these fighters are not local, so they are not invested the way local insurgents might be invested in ending the conflict, and they are also financed from abroad. So it is difficult then to end their incentives for continuing the fight, and I think it's going to frustrate efforts in this region to bring these civil wars to a close. Abdullah, one of the, the key ideological messages uh, for ISIS has been that they represent uh, a lot to a, a young disenfranchised Muslim. Um, they're, for, for example, they're helping restore the, the lost glories of, of, of Islam, uh, that they can represent you when the, a political system has failed. Uh, it's, it's a strong ideological current that has had appeal to, uh, to, to large numbers of, of young disenfranchised uh, Muslims around the world. To what extent do you think the, the defeats that it is suffering militarily, the, the clear suffering uh, within, uh, within its community, which was far from the utopia that, was, uh, that it actually sold itself to be, to what extent do you think that is going to diminish the message that, uh, that Daesh offers going forward? It is certainly a fact that the, the appeal of their slogan, Baqi uh, Tamaddad, is, is no more uh, remaining and expanding. It's more accurate to describe Daesh right now as Zaila Tatabaddad, shrinking and, and contracting. Uh, however, as I said earlier, um, it's the, it, Daesh will attempt to exploit any um, discontent within the Sunni population. So if, if, if uh, th these defeats militarily are not sustained by the successful restoration of basic services and good governance, we can be sure that Daesh will make a comeback. So uh, they, they will attempt uh, always to, to exploit these structural uh, variables and conditions unless addressed uh, properly. And that is really the challenge because when we look in the Middle East right now in our region, uh, lots of places, places are suffering uh, from chaos and instability, and these places provide a continued supply of rallying cries and causes for, to, to, to recruit, and also they, they provide safe havens and opportunities uh, uh, to, 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 for, for them to, to, to attract uh, recruits to come. So it is, uh, I mean, it's possible, things are possible to, to change to the better, but um, as I see it for the, long term, uh, uh, in, in the short term, um, it is very hard to, to be very optimistic right now. Okay, gentlemen, one quick question for you all before we open up the floor to our audience. Uh, Sir John, uh, we, we can't but help in our line of work to, to analyze the region through the, the prism of, uh, of nation states, through the prism of sovereignty. That's how you know, we, we see the world and we see the world order. But are we, are we doing, are we bringing uh, the right sort of discourse or understanding to the, the debate by not acknowledging that the, take, that, uh, that the Sunnis of the region, are, uh, for example, have suffered immensely over the last 13, 14 years? It's not, it, it is a nation state issue on one hand, but it's a, it's a broader issue on the other. Take Lebanon, 2005, the killing of Rafiq Hariri, 2003, the invasion of Iraq. 2011 onwards, the, uh, the failure to meaningly support a largely, almost majority Sunni opposition. Do we actually need to start framing the issues through this sort of a prism? <coughs> if you look at what, I mean, when the so-called Arab Spring, so you think about what people voted for when they had elections, and indeed what we saw in, in the polling, very extensive polling in some of these countries, uh, and voter behavior, um, people seemed uh, overwhelmingly to want uh, social welfare, good governance, uh, equitable governance. It wasn't the question of how you choose, chose the government. It's, it's really it's how the government behaves. Um, and, and that, for me, remains, remains the case. Uh, everything we see around the region in, in places which have suffered, even from places which have suffered greatly from civil conflict, from, from uh, civil war, from, from terrorism and so forth, uh, if you dig down, 
people want a restoration of services, they want a restoration of, 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 of INSAF, of, 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 of social justice, uh, and, and of distributional uh, policies, which give them hope for a better tomorrow than their, than their yesterday. I think that remains the case. And for that reason, people want strong central states. They want states that function. They don't want, I mean, one of the, one of the things we have seen since 2011 is, is, is the abject failure of most, of most uh, uh, dissident, uh, seditious, subversive uh, 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 movements to run states successfully, even Daesh, when they control their territory. I mean, if you looked at the, at, the, at the level of salaries that they started paying at the beginning, it was high, then it went down. Because there was a limit to how far their the extractive predatory model of statehood can function in a sustained way. You need central states. And people like states with borders. I refuse to believe that this has this, 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 this simply vanished. It was very striking. I think it was 2007 when, when Iraq, the football, uh, the Iraq's football team won the, won the, won the Asia Cup. There was an explosion of joy across the whole of Iraq. Now, I'm not saying that football is the answer to this, uh, but, it, but it tells you something about how people's identities are formed. It certainly reaffirmed that uh, the sense of nation was still fundamental to the sense of identity there. And I think it's a problem, because what we've also seen, if you think of Sunda versus Shia, I mean, who are the Sunda and who are the Shia? It's, it's, it, this, is, this is to fall into, into, into the sectarian trap that Daesh and others are setting for us. Richard, just, just quickly, uh, it's long been a, a criticism in the counter-terrorism counter age of uh, intelligence services that they're very good at the, uh, the SIGINT, the, uh, the technical intelligence, but uh, have taken a long time to adapt to the, the essential human intelligence. Does that criticism hold water now, 16 years into the, the war against global jihad? And if so, what to do about it? Yeah, I think, that, uh, I think it's fair to say that initially there was a real challenge in, in finding human sources to penetrate some of these very, very tight-knit groups. Many of those groups, of course, would only accept members into the core decision-making parts of them if they were already known. Maybe they were a relative or maybe they were vettable in some other way by calling back to their families and so on and finding out more about them. So there was a very real intelligence challenge, but not an intelligence challenge which is unknown in other parts of the world, of course. And many countries uh, were, became quite quickly quite, quite successful. But I think that the main initial uh, intelligence effort against these groups, the most successful one, was in the technical sphere because, of course, there were vast resources that could be deployed against people who didn't perhaps realize fully their vulnerabilities in the technical area. But certainly now, I would say, and you can see it from many of the operations that are conducted uh, across Iraq, Syria, uh, and in many other countries too, the exploitation of human intelligence has become very, very much better. I mean, there are real problems. Of course, there are ethical problems, there are legal problems, uh, and there are sort of human source running problems in having individuals penetrate violent extremist groups? You know, to what extent must they make uh, themselves acceptable to those groups by committing violent acts and so on? And the, the, you know, the, this gives rise, obviously, to big legal and ethical problems for the people running them. And there are many other issues like that, but nonetheless, I think that on the whole, and I hope Saudi colleagues here would agree, because they're very much in the forefront of this, that um, there's a great deal of useful human, which is exploited to very great effect. Thank you very much. Now, we're a little pressed for time, so I think it's, it's probably a, a good moment to throw the discussion open to the floor. So, if anybody has any questions, Your Royal Highness. Thank you very much. I could go, all day, go on all day listening to these gentlemen. Very informative and instructive. Three questions to Prince Abdullah. What about the story of the, those who have come back, Ta'ibun? Maybe you can shed some light on that from your place in, in the university. And for the panel, as, as uh, uh, Sir, Sir uh, Jan, uh, forgive me, it's, my mind is off. Um, 
the, um, the failing states as we see them in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in, uh, in, uh, in Yemen, provide a haven for these groups. But also the unresolved issues from decades, particularly in the Middle East, the uh, question of Palestine and so on, which gives the, the, the broad banner to these groups. Uh, if you look at, for example, the, uh, the Iranians uh, using uh, Palestine as, as a calling uh, for support among Muslims, uh, the name of the so-called interventionist brigade in, in Syria and Iraq is Al-Quds Brigade. And that has a resonance in, in the Islamic world. Uh, but also uh, the issues in, in Afghanistan when the, when the Soviets withdrew, the festering civil war there allowed for that place to host bin Laden and others like him. So please shed some light on, on, on these issues. And the third question, if I may say, the, the derivation of these groups comes from not just, I believe, what happened in Iraq or Afghanistan. I think it goes uh, before that to, uh, to um, uh, as I said, th the issues festering in the Middle East, but there was a very important congregation of these groups uh, before they became Fahish or Jabhat al-Nusra. In the Sudan, when uh, at Turabi collected what he called the international Muslim and, and, and world organizations uh, where Bin Laden first met with the, with the Egyptian uh, takfiris uh, and formed a bond with them which, laid, which uh, added to the Al-Qaeda and then from Al-Qaeda to Fahish. And I'm reminded of, of very much a similar happening in, in the 60s when, when the communist uh, movement uh, collected in, in Havana, Cuba with the Co Tri-Continental Congress, if you remember it, Historically, that's where all of the terrorist groups of, that, of those years, the revolutionary groups from Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America, and, and even Europe, which led to groups like Bader Meinhof and, and the Red Brigades in, in Italy and other groups like that. There is a correlation there between communism uh, using that method and then these groups trying to use the banner of Islam uh, under which they try to operate. Can you shed some light on that, please? Abdullah, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, thank you, Your Highness, for this important uh, question. So uh, the issue of returnees is very important. And I know that um, more than 750, I think, of Saudis who went already to Syria and Iraq have already returned. Some of them disillusioned and, and taibun, as, as uh, Prince Turkey said, others uh, determined to continue their terrorist activities at home. But those who are disillusioned are, uh, represent a, a great opportunities uh, if they are utilized in, 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 in a proper manner. And the reason I say this, because um, terrorist groups have long engaged in a strategy to discredit uh, the scholars, the, the Islamic scholars who do not agree with them. And this was back from the days of Al-Qaeda, from the late 1980s up until Daesh. Daesh even went further. They excommunicate the scholars and they call for their murder. Uh, just uh, two months ago, there was a campaign called Kill the Imams of Kufr. And they include in this, in this group of scholars everyone who disagrees with them. So uh, as a result, uh, members of this so-called, uh, and erroneously, I might say, jihadi trend or jihadi uh, current, um, they have come to view, uh, disregard any fatwa or view of any Islamic scholar other than, the, other than the, their own members. So uh, people who come from within that group and disillusioned, it's important to give them a platform and a voice to, to uh, maybe uh, use them in, in counter, to counter the, the, the extreme ideology. So they, they can prove uh, an important asset uh, in my opinion. Um, in my diplomatic career, I've worked in quite a lot of failed states, um, which, is, uh, which gave me a, a, a quite a closer view of, of, of them. I think one of the interesting things uh, 
what, what we say, in times of civil war, in times of conflict, you see a flight to security. We saw it, in, this is historically the case, in, in, in all revolutions, all civil wars, you see this. And we saw it, we saw it in Algeria uh, after 1990-91 with a, with a vicious uh, civil war in Algeria, which was, was, was defeated. Uh, but if you look at where, how, what people think about their government now in Algeria, it's, it's very striking. The first thing they want is security. The same happened in, in, in Libya. The same, to a certain extent, is something we see in, in, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, and this is something, ultimately, that Ibn Khaldun saw uh, uh, 700 years ago. This is, this is, this is Asabiya. People will talk about, you know, this is all about tribalism, this is all about uh, because states can't work. Tribes are strong, and tribes, I, I mean by tribes, any sort of group that has this sense of, of, of communal allegiance. Tribes are strong when states are weak. This was Weber's great insight uh, 100 years ago. Uh, so the important thing is what you do about states. And what we've seen uh, in the Middle East over the last 20 years, actually, I think, is the collapse of the, Repu of the Republican states of the North. Uh, we've seen it with Syria, we've seen it with, with Iraq for different reasons. We saw it, we've seen it in Libya, uh, and we, we, could, we could see it elsewhere, I think. Um, and this is a real problem. Uh, and this, this doesn't mean the states are, are, are useless. States are absolutely necessary. You have to reconstitute a state system in the Middle East. Now, I, I think you can only do this around the existing core of the Arab state system in the Middle East, which turns out to be the Gulf, which is, which is why the role of Saudi Arabia, I think, in the long term in places like Syria uh, or Iraq in particular is so important because I don't think you, d you can do this without support. Even in, in sort of practical terms like what you do about rebuilding Mosul or Tikrit or Ramadi or, for, or Fallujah. This is really important. Uh, it needs a reframing. Um, at, at a time of, of, of massive challenges uh, from Daesh and also from Iran and iran related militias and what, what we see about the activity of, of certain forms of, of, of Iranian back to militias across the broader event, I think this is really difficult. Uh, and I think this comes back to something Anash Carter was saying this morning, the convening power of the United States. I think actually this, this the, the visit we have at the moment in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia from President Trump is massively important if it represents a genuine and sustained return by the United States to its traditional role in the region, because I think it is indispensable if we're going to construct a better future. Your, your Highness is absolutely right about uh, the importance of looking at places where people are able to gather, share ideas, uh, but also to train. Uh, back in the 1960s, as you say, you had revolutionaries coming from as far away as Japan to train in camps uh, in the Middle East. Carlos the Jackal uh, was also famous for, for training in the Middle East. Um, and we see the same sort of dynamic uh, today, where at one conflict after another uh, not only generates battlefield experience, but almost as important or more important, it generates connections between these individuals that last long after the conflict ends. It also generates uh, networks of private individuals who donate money, and these networks continue after the conflict ends. Uh, and they tend to look for other conflicts as well. And, and, and my worry and those, uh, the worry of those who, who study uh, uh, jihadist kind of terrorism is that we have had so many years of conflict and the, the civil wars, particularly in Afghanistan, have gone on so long uh, that the level of training has been very high, but also the connections that have been made between these individuals. And we know when the conflict eventually winds down in Syria and Iraq, a number of the people who have been fighting in those theaters are going to go and look elsewhere for new conflicts, and they will draw on the networks that they have built uh, today. A question from Professor Amid Sani from Nigeria. Yes, sir. Is there perhaps a microphone? Uh, thank you very much. I, I, the first question I want to ask is this. Why is there so much emphasis on the military aspect of fighting counterterrorism or fighting terrorism? I mean, the, the alliance we have here of the military center for interaction. What about the intellectual and strategic aspect of it? Because if a fraction of what is spent on uh, military something, because it is not winnable militarily, and that is one question. The second one I want to say is that uh, the narrative on this aspect of the narrative on um, counterterrorism, it's not been given the same attention as the military aspect. 
And I want to advise that those factors that actually breed terrorism should be taken head on. People are talking about uh, uh, poverty, or poor, uh, youth unemployment, and things like that. I think it's better for us to actually follow those things and give a more forceful and coordinated narrative rather than only the military option. Thank you very much. John, uh, would you like to just touch on military versus strategy? I think we all agree in this, in this room that a, a coherent, cohesive strategy isn't quite there yet in, in terms of determining what happens next. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, this conference has been convened is to discuss the day after. So I, I think there's a broad understanding that there needs to be a coherent, inclusive plan, but how far are, away are we from it? And what do we need to do to actually formulate a successful well, I, plan? I'm, I'm not inside government anymore, so I, I, so I don't know what's, what's, ha what's happening inside government. That looking means you, at can, a, you can be more candid. Looking at it from outside, looking at it from outside, I've got to say I don't see a political strategy. Um, I see a military strategy, which is very effective, actually, in, 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 in Iraq and Syria. Uh, highly effective. Um, and I'm very glad it's there. But you're still left with a problem of how you, re how you, how you reconstitute the political compact between the central state and everybody in that state. And that's, that, that's a big problem. I think, incidentally, I, I was reading the professor's recent, recent piece on, on, I think it was you, Professor, on, uh, on Salafism in, in, in West Africa, which is, which is an interesting, actually, comparison. Because if you, if you look at the way that, that the particularly Islamist parties, or Islamist groups, uh, and, uh, and, and Salafi groups in particular, operate in West Africa, it's very distinctive. It's, it's very different to the way they operate here. Uh, it, and, it, it, and they seem to function within the existing boundaries of a state. So one of the questions is, why does that happen there, and why doesn't it happen here? And then what do you do about it? Well, could you quickly address just the, uh, the factors uh, that continue to drive uh, e extremism? Oh, right, the root causes question. Um, well, to, to, to be fair uh, to the field of terrorism studies, uh, we have looked a long time uh, to try and identify what are the fundamental things that are driving terrorism around the world, not only just this particular variety that we're discussing today. Uh, we do not have a lot of definitive conclusions. Um, I think it is fair to say, though, that one of the main drivers of uh, international terrorism today, particularly the Islamist variety, uh, are civil wars. Um, I, I think it is incontestable that if there were no civil wars in this region over the past 30 years, we would not be facing an organization like Daesh or others. People would not be able to come and get training, they wouldn't develop the links, so on and so forth. Um, it's not the ideology that really drives this stuff, it is the breaking of these societies uh, that attracts the ideology, makes it appealing and useful as a way to organize people uh, to fight. So if I had to point to one root cause, I think it would be civil wars above all others. A question from the gentleman here. Shukran. Uh, اسم الدكتور محمد بن حمو رئيس المركز المغربي للدراسات الاستراتيجية أود فقط أن أعود إلى ربما بعض النقط التي تم الإشارة إليها من خلال المتدخلين حين وضع المنظمون الموضوع أعتقد بأن وضعه كان جيدا طبيعة تطرف ومستقبل الإرهاب وفيما في مختلف ما تفضل به المتدخلون كانت هناك العديد من الأشياء الجيدة والممتازة ولكن أعتقد بأن هناك بعض التساؤلات والأسئلة التي طرحت وربما أن من الأسئلة التي كان ينبغي طرحها كانت أخرى نحن أمام ظاهرة معقدة مركبة ظاهرة تتطور بسرعة وبالتالي قد تكون المقاربة وكذلك الوسائل التي نتعامل معها أو نتعامل بها اليوم مع هذه الظاهرة متجاوزة لأنها لا زالت وسائل التعامل مع الظاهرة كما كانت في السابق 
فبدل السؤال من يدعم داعش اليوم ربما أن السؤال هو كيف وصلنا إلى داعش ولماذا وما هي الأسباب وبدل أن نعتقد بأن الأسباب توجد بأحضان المجتمعات المسلمة أعتقد بأنه حان الوقت لننظر إلى أن الأسباب هي خارج المجتمعات المسلمة كذلك وبدل أن نعتقد بأن المسؤوليات تقع على الدول المسلمة هناك مسؤولية مشتركة مع باقي دول العالم وبالتالي أعتقد بأنه في مواجهة موضوع من هذا الشكل ومن هذا الحجم علينا أن نكون صرحاء بيننا لأن العدو الذي نواجهه هو عدو مشترك فالمسؤولية هي مسؤولية مشتركة والرد ينبغي أن يكون ردا مشتركا والمقاربة ينبغي أن تبنى بطريقة مشتركة ولا أن يتم التملص من المسؤولية على حساب الدول المسلمة فقط بدعوة أن هذا الأمر يحمل أو أو ينشط تحت يافطة إسلامية حين نتحدث عن متى يتحول الفرد إلى إرهابي أعتقد بأن السؤال هو كيف ولماذا يتحول الفرد إلى إرهابي اليوم لأن مسألة التطرف فالتطرف هو مسلسل كان في الماضي يطول في الزمن أما الآن نحن أمام ظاهرة ابتعد عنها طابع الإيديولوجية وابتعد عنها طابع الغطاء الإسلامي إذا كان التطرف قبل خمس وتيرت مرحلة الحرب الأهلية في الجزائر منذ عشرين سنة أو خمسطار سنة حين كنت أشتغل على الجزائر كانت مسلسل تطرف يدوم إلى 12 أو 14 شهر اليوم ينقلب الفرد من بين قوسين عادي إلى متطرف في غضون أسبوع إذا هناك إشكال حقيقي وينبغي أن نطرح الأسئلة الحقيقية وينبغي أن نبحث عن الأجوبة الحقيقية كذلك لأن الأمر كذلك نحن أمام ظاهرة ربما أن ما يميزها أنها ظاهرة حاقدة ظاهرة انتقامية وبالتالي ظاهرة يمكن اعتبارها بأنها رد فعل حين تطرح قضية وإشكالية الآن المقاتلون الإرهابيون الأجانب خلال 30 سنة من الحرب بأفغانستان عدد المقاتلين الأجانب الذين انتقلوا إلى أفغانستان بلغ عددهم عشرة ألاف في عشر سنوات من الحرب بالعراق عدد المقاتلين الأجانب الذين انتقلوا إلى العراق عشرة ألاف في أربع سنوات من الحرب بسوريا والعراق عدد مقاتلين الأجانب الذين انتقلوا إلى سوريا والعراق سبعة وأربعين ألف وسبعمية حين ندخل في منطلق أو دول منطلقهم كيف يمكن أن نفسر أن عدد من انتقلوا من الدول الأوروبية تجاوز ثمانة آلاف من المقاتلين الإرهابيين الأجانب فبالتالي هناك أسئلة هي بالنسبة للدول المسلمة ينبغي أن تجد لها الأجوبة ولكن هناك أسئلة بالنسبة للدول الغربية وباقي دول العالم ينبغي أن تجد لها الأجوبة ثم وأعتذر لن أطيل كثيرا حين نتحدث عن العائدون وسمو الأمير طرح الإشكالية الحقيقية للعائدين لأننا فعلا أمام ظاهرة خطيرة جدا ليس لنا علم الآن بعدد من قتلوا وعدد العائدين قد نكون في تصنيفنا لهم بالتائبين نرتكب خطا اضافيا لانهم للاسف شديد قد يكونوا عكس ذلك فاين يتبخر هؤلاء المقاتلون تم الاشاره الى ليبيا قبل انطلاق العمليات في ليبيا وفي الشريط المتوسطي كان عدد المقاتلين الارهابيين الذين التحقوا بداعش سبعة آلاف وخمسمائة بعد نهاية العمليات في سرت قتل منهم ألفين وخمسمائة أين تبخر خمسة آلاف مقاتل إرهابي ينتمون لداعش الآن ما يحدث في سوريا والعراق والموصل 
كانت أعداد كبيرة أين ذهب الكثير منهم إذا إشكالية العائدون هي إشكالية حقيقية وتدبيرها ينبغي أن يكون تدبيرا جيدا لأنه يعتبر فعلا تهديدا حقيقيا للأمن وللاستقرار بالنسبة للدول ثم لا يمكن أن نتحدث عن هذه الإشكالية بغض النظر عن تضارب الأجندات الإقليمية والدولية وبغض النظر كذلك عن المسؤوليات التي كانت قائمة بالنسبة ولا زالت بالنسبة لبعض الدول في المنطقة وأقصد بالأساس هنا إيران ثم نقطة أخيرة إن سمحت لا يمكن أن نتحدث عن هذا الإشكال بغض النظر عن مسألة التعاون الدولي وبالأساس التعاون الاستخباراتي ولكن بالنسبة للغرب حين يكون هناك حديث عن التعاون الاستخباراتي مع الدول المسلمة فما هو مطلوب هو أن نتقاسم ما بيدنا وليس أو هكذا يفهم من طرفهم وليس أن يتقاسموا معنا ما لديهم الاستخبارات كما تعلمون هي في شقين أساسيين إن كان هناك تحكم في الاستخبارات البشرية فنحن للأسف نلاحظ بأن الدول الغربية لا تتقاسم الاستخبارات التقنية التي تتوفر عليها فبالتالي لا يمكن أن نواجه هذا الخطر وهذا التهديد وهذا العدو إلا إذا كانت لنا مواقف واضحة وإرادة واضحة وكذلك رغبة في أننا نواجه عدو مشترك شكرا There's a lot to take in there, but Richard, could I ask you just to, to address the issue of uh, whether Western states and countries away from this region have shared their responsibilities, have showed their responsibilities for the situation that we find ourselves now in? Uh, before you answer, uh, we're well over time, and if I could uh, just uh, invite, uh, when, uh, when Richard's finished uh, his questions, Ipti Sam and uh, also Police General Elias uh, to, to ask their questions. Richard. Okay, well, I, I, if I may, I'll just address that issue of intelligence sharing. Um, well, there is a great deal of intelligence sharing. I think there wasn't so much before 9-11, maybe. There could have been a lot more. But now there is a great deal because essentially the security of one state is very much bound up with the security of other states. So it's in the interest of all states to ensure that internal stability and other threats uh, to, to, to security are dealt with. And if it means in sh sharing intelligence, that's clearly something that will happen. And certainly any state, where, whether it's a Western state or, or a Muslim-majority country or any other country, uh, will be pretty upset if it finds out that an attack in its own country could have been averted had they been recipients of intelligence that was already in the possession of another country. And I don't believe that happens so much. Of course, there are politics involved. And of course, some countries will not uh, be so interested in the stability of other countries. They're those sort of political rivalries. And terrorism, after all, thrives in this complex political uh, atmosphere that, that the world finds it's in, uh, itself in today. But I think uh, just one other point on this. I think that many people, not professionals like you, but many people think that there must be some intelligent silver bullet out there which could solve these problems and destroy these groups and thwart their attacks. That is very, very rarely the case. Intelligence, yes, can shine a very bright light, but it's usually on a very small part of the picture, and there has to be a bigger analysis from other sources of what that picture really is and what actions have to be taken as a result. If you sign. If, uh, we're well over time. Uh, Thank you. So uh, my name is Sam Kitwi, I am from UAE and heading a think tank called Emirates Policy Center. Just want to bring your attention, especially our Western colleague, that terrorism is not only Sunni. There are a terrorist group, Shia terrorist group, like Asaib al Haq, like Failak Bani Badr, like Hezbollah, doing the same what uh, ISIS is doing, and also having, like ISIS had, a caliphate state, they have the global Mahdi state. So uh, just, just concentrating on ISIS and uh, forgetting about the other militias group, it doesn't take us to anywhere because uh, what ISIS is doing, 
based on sectarian issue, raised also by Iran, created by Iran, and John mentioned he was in Iraq, what the Iranian did, the Iraqi, they were living, and the whole region, living Sunnah and Shia and Jewish, Christian, we didn't have before uh, this kind of uh, conflicts. The other thing that we cannot fight terrorism militarily only. You need to fight it the uh, ideological, uh, social, economic, politics, wherever if there is vacuum in Syria, vacuum in Libya, vacuum in Iraq, you will find always terrorist group are flour flourishing there and you cannot, you cannot stop terrorism. Thank you. Just on the, on the issue of uh, Shia militias, it's a very relevant, very important issue. Uh, but the, the, the theme for this discussion was uh, Daesh 2.0, what comes next for, for, for Islamic State. I personally think that there's a, a lot that needs to be discussed about the, the Shia militias, particularly in Iraq and Syria, where their role is clear and obvious. And uh, the, the extent to which they feed into a sense of disaffection, uh, ideologically committed militias which are beholden to Iran and its, and its the values of the Islamic Revolution are very real issues in the Middle East and strategic issues and they are worthy of significant discussion. Uh, we, we don't have the time to do that here today uh, but I hope that uh, elsewhere in this, in this very important conference that will be addressed. Um, we're very much over time and uh, I, I thank you all very much for, your, for listening and for contributing to the discussion. I thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Abdullah bin Khalid al -Sal, Sir John Jenkins, Will McCants, and Richard Barrett. And uh, thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, for, uh, for, for being present throughout our session.